Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hope everything is well with you at home. Seniors, we're almost there, right? Um, th later on this week, I'm going to be releasing into the wild your open book file. Really, it's going to be a series of uh, uh, about five questions, four or five questions from each chapter we've covered, right? Um, so it'll be about something in the vicinity of 15 to 18 questions, something like that. All right, it'll be uh, open book, right? Um, open te you know, open notes. You can research the answer. All I want from you are complete answers to each question. Uh, you will see on the test that I may require some written explanations about how you do it. So be thorough in your written explanations. Okay. The only rule is you've got to do your own work. You can't work with another person in class and you can't ask some other helper person to sit down next to you and answer your questions and help you with it okay it's not a homework assignment it's going to be like a take-home test and so i'm going to trust everybody to to do their own work on this okay it'll be due on the official so it's gonna uh, it, um, that's gonna be uh, released this coming looks like uh, as i uh, it looks like it's going to be wednesday the 20th okay and that'll be due two weeks hence it's going to be june 3rd which was would have been the day of our math final right but instead it'll be due it'll be the day on which your math finals will be due you're perfectly free to turn them in before that obviously you don't have to turn them in on that day but that day is the deadline okay all right so uh, i'll put that all in an announcement and in writing to send it out to you but that's essentially the deal on the final and i just want to keep it simple and hopefully relatively stress-free and frankly easy okay all right anyway um so let's see so this last little bit here is going to be about the indefinite integral now that's related to the idea of a definite integral that we've been working on and you'll see how in just a second here okay all right and the idea of our definite integral worked like this right we said okay we've got an integral between some limits a to b of f of x dx and what that represented was the area under the curve under f of x you understand between from on the interval from a to b right and it was that area there now in the beginning in the last chapter the first thing we did about calculating that area under the curve was we was we used rectangles right and we found that if we'd smaller and smaller and smaller rectangles that is if our we divided that into intervals and each interval was estimated, the area in each interval was estimated by using a, 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 a rectangle, right? And if we let those number, if we let the interval for each rectangle get smaller and smaller and smaller, we ended up with an estimate that was closer and closer to the actual area under the curve, right? And the actual area under the curve was represented by an amount of function called f of x right now we explored what the relationship between capital f of x and little f of x was right and it turned out that it worked like this that f prime of x was equal to f of x that if we knew f of x ahead of time for some reason, capital F I mean, and we took the derivative, it, we'd get little f of x, where little f of x was the y value over here, and x of course was the horizontal axis, right? Okay. Or since that's since which is how we did it before, right? We spent two or three chapters on the idea that we're going to start with some function capital f of x take the derivative of it using our various derivative rules and get little f right well in this section of course we're working the other way around we're finding the antiderivative and what we discovered was this that the capital f 
was actually the antiderivative of f, right? And that's really the second part of the fun and, and the, the part of the the fun. This is all what we call the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? And and it really had two parts to it, right? First off, that we calculated this by doing this, right? We calculated the antiderivative of little f and gave us big F. And then we evaluated, in order to find this area under the curve, we evaluated f of b between a and b. We evaluated capital F of b minus capital F of a. Antiderivative evaluated at B minus antiderivative evaluated at A. And the reason why that worked was that basically the same picture here, A, B, right? Different color. Okay. Capital F of B, that's that area all the way back, right? Capital F of A. That's that area there, all the way back, right? The difference between the two gives you the area under the curve from A to B. Okay, and that's the, we call that really the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And the second part was kind of implicit in that, and that was that this here, F primed is equal to little f. That is, if we, that is this integral here, f of x dx is equal to f of x plus c. Remember, we always put a constant on the end of it, okay? So this is the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, and this is the second part. And they kind of, they're not really separate. They kind of work together, don't they? Okay? Now, in practical terms, the big difference between the two is if you're, cal if, if you're asked to calculate this, right, you're supposed to get a number out of it, which is the actual area, right? You still have to calculate the antiderivative, but you use that antiderivative to actually calculate an area under the curve. If you're, and this is called, and I'll put it in red, this is called, to make sure we're clear, Let's see, the definite interval, right? Okay, whereas this one here, if we're confronted with this problem, which looks the same, except it won't have limits of integration, A and B, that's called an indefinite integral. All right, and the answer to this is not a number like that one would be, but simply as whatever the antiderivative it plus the constant. Technically, a family of functions, right? Because it could be there could be more than one. If we started here, there'd be more than one integral, more than one function here that we'd work backwards to to get f by taking the derivative. Okay. So this is the second part. So this is first part, and this is second part right here of the um, of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay. So we're gonna focus on that for this lesson here. A little bit of taste, a little bit about finding these indefinite integrals. Okay. So a um. But that's really the relationship. There's two kinds of integrals that you can that you can find the definite and the indefinite okay so let's say for now we had now you know for some functions it's a relatively simple process remember we had these derivative rules right derivative rules so we had stuff like we said okay so if f of x is equal to a x to the n, well then f primed 
was equal to, that is the derivative was equal to uh, n times a x to the n minus 1. That was our, we called that our power rule. Well, for antiderivatives, it's this work backwards. So this is the antiderivative. Like this, right? Where if we've got f of x is equal to ax to the n, then capital F is going to be a over n plus 1 x to the n plus 1. Okay, that's if you're start. This is if you're taking the derivative, so you're working down. You're working down. You understand. This is the antiderivative, so you're working up. These being the same a to the n a x to the n function. Okay, we also had rules like this. We had f of x if f of f of f if f of x was sine x, then f prime of x y that was equal to cosine x, right? And if f of x was equal to cosine x, then f prime of x was equal to negative sine x. Now, technically, if you remember the chain rule, if you remember the if you remember the chain rule, then for example, with this function here, it's easiest to see here. This is the derivative of the outside. Then the derivative of the inside would be times dx. Now, typically, dx would just be equal to 1, but it could be anything inside there. So this would be cosine x times the derivative of the inside is dx. That's why one way we see we end up with over here, when we're taking the antiderivative, we always start with, so over here it would be sine x dx, or if let's, if the, if we've got the derivative, if we're finding, uh, if the, yeah, here we go. For starting with cosine x, What's the function that if you take the derivative of it, you get sine x? Well, look over here. If we're starting with cosine x dx, right, then that's going to be sine x plus c. Over here, if we're starting with cosine x, the derivative would be negative sine x dx. So over here, if we're starting with sine x dx, the derivative would be negative cosine x plus c, because we still have to have a negative in there, okay? So that's how that goes. So these are all, so, so you know, at, at kind of the beginning level here, if we're just, if we're taking antiderivatives, it, sometimes we're just working backwards, right? Uh, we had this one here. If we had f of x was equal to ln x, Remember our, our, our derivative rule, f prime of x was equal to 1 over x, then times what d whatever x was, right? So therefore, if we're starting with 1 over x dx, then a derivative, then the antiderivative will be ln x plus c. Okay? Or if we've got, we got one more we can do here f of x is equal to e to the x. That was its own derivative, remember, so that was e to the x dx. So the antiderivative is going to, of e to the x dx, why that's just e to the x plus c. Put a bit of plus c up there for that one too. Okay, so that's the idea here. Then, uh, relatively recent, so we spent, you know, so you see those are just flip-flops to each other. Now, it turns out that if this is a more complicated function, let's say a product of two functions, right, or a quotient of two functions or something like that, turns out it's a little more complicated, like with derivatives, right? But for now, we can use these sort of direct antiderivative rules. Now, we also had, by the way, uh, relatively recently, we had these rules here. We said that uh, if we've got uh, uh, 
an application of this, if we've got k is a constant, k dx, that then the derivative of that, I mean the antiderivative of that would be kx plus c. You can see it this way, if we take the derivative where k is a constant, if we take the derivative of this, c goes to 0, and the derivative like of like 3x would just be plain 3, right? And then we also had these rules here, right? Make sure I'm not... leaving something out, if we had k times f of x on the inside where f of x was just any function multiplied by a constant, we could factor or move that constant to the outside of the, of the integral. And lastly, we had a, 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 a sum and difference formula. If we had f of x plus g of x dx, then that was equal to f of x plus dx plus g of x dx integrated separately. So if we were adding or subtracting like with derivatives, we would do each part separately. And each of these had an equivalent derivative rule over here. Okay, so we're going to use these today to work some antiderivative problems, okay? All right, so I think I'm going to end this video here, and the next one will be just some examples of how we're going to use these, okay? And I'm also going to upload some classwork with all the answers attached so that you can check your work and make sure you're okay in the homework because the homework's going to be in the book, okay? All right, bye.